Welcome to Words of Grace, radio ministry of Elder Ben Winslet, pastor of the Flint River Primitive Baptist Church near Huntsville, Alabama. We invite you to stay tuned to today's broadcast. We greet you in the name of Christ and welcome you to today's episode of Words of Grace in which we come to message four in our series on the sovereignty of God in salvation. Our first message in this series was entitled, Why Should I Believe in Sovereign Grace? and was a basic survey of the subject of the sovereignty of God in salvation from Scripture. The next program was on a very fitting subject that is crucial to understand for sovereign grace to make as much sense as it can make, which was a subject of total depravity. And last week on the radio broadcast in our third message from this series, we considered God's sovereignty in general. And so we looked at passages from the Old and the New Testament asserting that nothing happens outside of God's sovereign authority. God is sovereign, meaning he does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, if and because he wants. His counsel shall stand. He will do all his pleasure. None can say unto him, What doest thou? Or stay his hand. And also, anything that occurs does so, because he either causes it to be, or he suffers it or permits it to be. Otherwise, he would not be the sovereign Lord of the universe, but with biblical certainty, we can say he is. Today, we want to look at a specific subject under this umbrella of the sovereignty of God in salvation, God's sovereign choice of a people in which he ordained them before the foundation of the world unto salvation. Before we go into this subject today, I want to give you a little bit of a short preface. What I'm sharing with you today is, to many believers, very controversial, and I would even say offensive. But as always, I want you to consider this, and the Lord give you understanding. Search the scriptures as the noble Bereans to see if these things be so, and if they are so, well, what should be my response to that? As Romans chapter 3 says, let God be true and every man a liar. If what I am saying is in alignment with thus saith the word of the Lord, then it's something that we ought to believe. It's something that we must believe, something that is true, that we must bow our knees to. This is reality according to the word of God. And so consider what I say, the Lord give you understanding. To begin today, what I am speaking about the sovereignty of God in choosing. This refers to the work of God the Father in our salvation. Just as much as God is a triunity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so is the work of salvation accomplished by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is a trinity, and salvation, the work of salvation, God saving sinners, is trinitarian in its formula. Now, what I mean by that, each person of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have one of the works of salvation, as it were, attributed to them. The covenant phase of salvation was before the world began and is attributed to God the Father. God the Father chose the Son here in time on the cross of Calvary redeemed the people that the Father had chosen by dying on the cross for them. And so the work of salvation that Christ accomplished for us was the legal phase of salvation, the legal aspect of our salvation. We have been justified by the shedding of the blood of Christ. The Father made him, the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is to say, Jesus was the sin bearer. He bore the consequences of our iniquity, though he had none of his own. He had zero iniquity of his own, but the Father has laid on him the iniquity of us all, and that was the legal phase of salvation. That is what Christ did for us upon the cross. Well, what about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit regenerates and quickens those that the Father chose and that the Son died for. 
And you find all of these linked together like links of a chain in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. And that obviously refers to the final phase of salvation, when we are raised incorruptible, will be with the Lord in glory forever, conformed to the image of his Son in glorified bodies. Though we were sown in corruption, we will be raised incorruptible. But if you noticed, God the Father predestinated us, God the Son justified us, and God the Spirit called us. These are the phases or aspects that each person of the Godhead is chiefly responsible for in Scripture. Salvation is Trinitarian. However, you and I can't, nor should we try to over-compartmentalize the works of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in salvation either. For instance, the Father chose us, but how did He choose us? He chose us in Christ according to His grace. Also, the Father judged His Son upon the cross of Calvary, satisfying his wrath. As we read in Isaiah chapter 53, it pleased the Father, it appeased his wrath to bruise his Son. So, the Father has something to do with our redemption as well. Christ also made his offering, according to Hebrews, through the eternal Spirit. And so there the Holy Spirit is connected with the concept of our redemption, something that Christ did upon the cross. Also, the new birth is attributed to the Holy Spirit. We're born of the Spirit, and I think that's Christianity 101, something that we all understand if we're believers. But this is also attributed to the drawing of the Father in John chapter 6, the teaching that God does to know Him, and we will all know Him, we will all be taught of God from the least to the greatest. At the same time, it is the Spirit of His Son that is sent into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, at the new birth. Well, the new birth is by the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit of His Son is sent into our hearts. And it is by the voice of the Son of God in John 5, by which we are regenerated, just like He spoke and Lazarus came forth from the dead. Jesus speaks, and our dead souls shall live. So while we can clearly see what we call the phases or aspects of salvation in Scripture, and they are attributed to one of the three persons of the Godhead, the Father chose, the Son redeemed, and the Holy Spirit quickened, or regenerated, or gave the new birth. We also can't separate them or compartmentalize them distinct from the other two persons of the Godhead. But that is extraordinarily fitting, and honestly to be expected, since these three that bear record in heaven are what? Well, they are one. God is a tri-unity. God is in complete harmony and unison on every act of God, and we see that here in time. We see that when the Lord Jesus was here, he came not to do his own will, but the will of the Father that had sent him. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always in complete agreement on everything. They are three persons of the Godhead, and yet they are one God, as we recently emphasized. And so there will never be disagreement or conflict of purpose within the triunity. It just makes total sense, then, that the roles of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in salvation bleed over into the actions of the other two persons of the Godhead. As we think about the sovereignty of God the Father in choosing people to be saved, that's our subject today, the sovereignty of God in choosing, a word that comes to mind that is a synonym for choose, the verb, and it is a synonym for chosen as a noun, and that is the word elect. This word elect occurs 17 times in Scripture, with 13 of those occurrences being in the New Testament. One of those references has to do with angels, elect angels. One of those references has to do with Christ as God's elect, the chosen Messiah. And the other references have to do with people, people like you and me, people that are the elect or people that God did elect. That word elect, as it has reference to a group of individuals, means the chosen, and that's a noun, But to elect someone 
is a verb. And what that means is that they are being chosen or you are choosing them. As far as that usage is concerned, that's not foreign to us at all as Americans, because what do we do every four years in our country? We elect another president, and this is an election year. We know what it means to elect someone. It means that someone is chosen by the population to a certain role or a certain responsibility. Well, when people are elected then, what does that mean of them? They were chosen for something, to something. Who did the choosing? Well, as we will see today, God the Father did the choosing, but they are people who have been chosen. Now, one thing that we will see very clearly today, not everyone is an elect person. Not everyone is a chosen person. God, according to Revelation 5, 9 and 7, 9, chose people out of every nation, kindred, and tongue. That doesn't mean every nation, kindred, and tongue is heaven-bound, that is to say, everyone in every nation, kindred, and tongue. No, universalism is not true. But at the same time, out of every nation, kindred, and tongue, did God choose people? He chose people from all around the world to salvation. But there are people that are not chosen. It would make no sense if everyone was elect, as sometimes people will assert, for the word chosen to be used at all. Because to choose implies, well, it more than implies, someone that is not chosen. If you choose an apple at the store... The other apples you left there where they already were. So choosing naturally involves selecting one out of a group or several out of a group. Now, I said that there were 17 references, usages of the word elect in Scripture. And what I want to do is just go through some of these together. These are not all of them. We won't look at the Old Testament passages from Isaiah or reference the one that has reference to angels, but listen to the variety of places in which this word occurs. Matthew 24, verse 24, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and if it be possible, they shall deceive the very elect. These false prophets, if it's possible, will deceive the elect of God. Well, that's the goal of false prophets in the world. That's what the wicked one wants. He wants God's people to be deceived, the chosen, the very chosen. And verse 31 of that same chapter, God shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet or with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, his what? His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. Who is gathered in the second coming of Christ by the angels and carried away to be with God in glory? Well, it's the elect. Mark chapter 13, verse 22, For false Christs and false prophets shall arise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Verse 27 of Mark 13, Then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth unto the uttermost part of heaven. And I would just point out, Mark actually adds the phrase with regards to the elect that it is the elect whom he has chosen. So it's important to understand that election is literally defined in that reference, the elect whom he has chosen. Luke 18, verse 7, Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? And that is in the context of the parable of the unjust judge, where a widow comes to a judge and begs him day in and day out to avenge her of her adversaries, well, the point there is twofold. One, that we should pray always and never faint. But two, that God will avenge his elect, his chosen, the people that he has chosen. That's one of the points of the parable of the unjust judge. If an unjust judge is going to avenge a widow woman, a woman with no husband, because she's annoying him, imagine how God will avenge the bride of his own son who cries unto him day and night. And that's the point of the parable of the unjust judge. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 33, we read, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who shall say, God, your people are so sinful, they've done terrible things, let's petition you to send them to a place of torment. No, it is God that justified them. When he gave his son on the cross of Calvary to die for them, they will be with him in glory because he has justified them. 
Though they are counted as sheep for the slaughter all the day long, they are more than conquerors through Christ that loved them. Colossians 3.12, we read an exhortation to the elect of God. Put on therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and longsuffering, as chosen people, God expects you to be people of compassion, people of mercy, people of humility, people of meekness, people of long-suffering, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. That's what it means to be elect, to be chosen, holy, beloved of God. Well, put on, therefore, take this unto you as a garment, put on the new man, put off the old man, and live in a way that pleases the Lord that chose you and called you. Paul says in the book of Titus chapter 1, Paul, a servant of God, this is verse 1, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. The faith of God's what? The faith of God's elect. As a noun, as a group of people, these are people that God has chosen, but you notice that there's a distinguishing trait among them. Did you catch that? The faith of God's elect? When Paul wrote a passage from Ephesians 1 that we're going to cite in a moment about being chosen in him before the foundation of the world, one of the things that he says in his address to them is, I'm writing to you, the saints at Ephesus, and the faithful in Christ Jesus that are scattered abroad. If you are a person of faith, understand that God the Father has chosen you to salvation. God the Father chose you, person of faith, and so as he writes to those who have faith, he says you've been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. Here in Titus 1 and verse 1, we read that faith is the faith of God's elect. God's elect are who possess faith. In 1 Peter 1, 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace be multiplied. Peter says here that we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God. And in the close of the broadcast today, we will consider the question, does that mean that God chose us based upon foreseen merit? Did he foreknow what we would do, or did he foreknow us? And I would just insist that he foreknew us. That word foreknow means to love beforehand, the way Adam knew his wife Eve and loved her. There's a love that Adam had for Eve. There's a love that the Father had for us beforehand, and that is what foreknowledge is all about. First Peter 2 and verse 6, this is referring to Christ being a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. And then you find some references to election, usages of this word elect in the book of Second John, verse 1 and verse 13. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, this is either a chosen woman and her children, or this is a church and God's children who are going to assemble there, who worship there. And either of those are great opinions to have about this. But this is an elder, an apostle, writing to the elect lady and her children. And then he says in verse 13, The children of thy elect sister greet thee. This is why I think he's really talking about churches, because the children of thy elect sister, that would be another church, and the members of that church greet thee. Amen. So, you just read with me several references to this word election and this concept of election in the Word of God. I want to sew this portion of the broadcast up together by simply reading for you 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4. Knowing, brethren beloved, your election of God. Election is controversial to us today in Christianity, but I want you to understand that election was not controversial in the first century. Because Paul said to the Thessalonians, Beloved brethren in Thessalonica, you know your election. You know that you are a person who has been chosen of God. Now, why do they know their election? For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. You know that you are an elected person because the word came unto you in power. You believed it. Remember, it's the faith of God's elect, only elect people have faith. And so their reception of the gospel brought their life and immortality to light. And it declares their identity as the elect of God. They know their election because the word came unto them. The gospel came unto them, not in word only, but also in power. So from all of this, we see that election is an undeniable biblical principle. One that we can't simply ignore. We can't sweep it under the rug. 
we can't pretend that it doesn't exist. And it also shouldn't be the elephant in the room that we know is there, but we don't want to look at it. I'm not really sure where that figure of speech came from, but we don't want election to be the elephant in the room. It's there and we should acknowledge it. How then do we define election in a more specific sense? Well, look to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. This is about the most explicit, clearly presented explanation of election, of which I'm aware in the Bible. One of the most clearly depicted descriptions of election in the Word of God. We read in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And so God the Father chose us in Christ before the world began. Before time, he set our final destiny to, number one, be conformed to the image of Christ, as you see in Romans chapter 8. And number two, he predestined or set our destiny beforehand to be adopted as children, as you see here in Ephesians 1, 5. And I would just insist that both of those statements, predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son or predestinated under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself, have reference to the same exact thing. We will be conformed to the image of Christ when we are raised again in the last day, and we will finally have full adoption in that day. We've been given the spirit of adoption, but adoption is not a completed process until the redemption of the purchased item. In other words, we stand redeemed, but one day Jesus is going to come take possession of that, which he paid for. And that's when redemption is completed, when adoption is fully acted upon, and that transaction is completed when he receives what he has already paid for. Understand, Jesus is coming back for you, body, soul, and spirit. He's going to raise you again. And in that day, we who are fleshly and foreign and of Adam, we will be fully conformed to the image of Christ, able to enjoy fellowship with him. We will be with him forevermore, and the deal will be done, as it were. Everything that he has purposed shall have been completed regarding our salvation and this universe that he has created. So to put this the way that Luke did as he recorded for us the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13, as many as were ordained to eternal life believed, you and I, if we have been elected of God, we have been ordained to eternal life. That's a very strong word from Scripture. God has ordered it so. As the King of kings and Lord of lords, he has ordained us to salvation. You'll notice that this gives us another focus of study in the Bible, things that happened before the world began. Because we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, we now can begin looking into things that happened before God created the universe. Second Timothy chapter 1 gives us the gospel, the story of salvation in a nutshell, and it references before the foundation of the world. God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. This was given us in Christ before God created the universe. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, we read, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And so you have this covenant of grace, as it were, God selecting, appointing the Savior, His Son, and the Holy Spirit agreeing to come into the world and quicken them. You have all of this being decided before God created the universe, even before the beginning of time. Now, this concept also explains statements Jesus made all throughout his ministry, by the way. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, All the Father gave him shall come to him. In John 10, Jesus says his sheep were given to him of his Father. 
In John 17, Jesus said he has power over all flesh to give eternal life to as many as the Father has given him. Well, when did this giving of people to the Son take place? You read it just a moment ago in Ephesians chapter 1. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And again, this refers to what we like to call the covenant of grace before the foundation of the world. The last thought that I want to share with you today, was this election sovereign or was this election based upon foreseen merit? Because many people today will say, well, God chose them because he knew that they would accept him. And that would be election based upon foreseen merit. Or some other people might say, God chose Christ and everyone who is in Christ is elect because they accept him and they become a part of him. And since God chose Christ, by extension of that, he chose all the people that would eventually be a part of the family of God because their own choice. But in that framework, God didn't choose the people themselves. So how do we answer those questions? Well, first of all, remember total depravity. There's none that doeth good, no, not one, Romans 3. There's none that seek after God, according to Romans 3. According to Romans 3, there's none that understands God. There's none who fear God. There's no fear of God before their eyes. To the natural man, the gospel then is foolishness. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 2, 14, and many other passages. In fact, in the book of Psalms, we read that God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did seek him or understand, and they are all gone astray. They are all gone out of the way. So if God looked down from heaven to say, hey, who's going to choose me so I can choose them? Who's going to believe so I can choose them? What he would have seen is that no one understands him. No one seeks after him. Total depravity says, as we emphasized a couple of weeks ago, there's none that's going to seek after God until God quickens them, raises them from spiritual death, as you see in Ephesians 1.19. We believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And also, number two, Paul clarifies this entire concept in Romans chapter 9. He says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And Regarding Jacob and Esau, they're both pretty wretched guys as their story begins in the Bible. In verse 11, we read, For the children, Jacob and Esau, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. So before the children were born, and they were both rotten sinners from the moment of their conception and their birth into the world. It wasn't that one was good and one was bad, or both were good and God rejected one. That's not the case. They were both bad, and God chose one to be merciful to, and the other one he left where he was. You might say, well, that sounds unfair, and you might accuse God of wrongdoing there. But remember, fair is to be punished for a crime that we commit, and we are all guilty criminals. So as we see here, God is sovereign in whom he will show mercy. Look at this. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Romans 9, 14. God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. God chooses in his sovereignty whom to show mercy unto And that is the election of grace. Consider what I say. The Lord give thee understanding. Again, I'm Ben Winslet, thanking you for listening to Words of Grace today, inviting you to write and let me know that you've received today's broadcast. And also, please be sure to tune in again next week at this time. Until then, may the Lord's richest blessings be yours, is my prayer. If you enjoy the messages you hear on Words of Grace, consider this your invitation to visit a Primitive Baptist Church in your community. Address your correspondence to Words of Grace Radio, 641 Moontown Road, Brownsboro, Alabama, 35741, or visit us online at flintriverpbc.org.